Thus I have heard, at one time the Lord dwelt in bliss with the Vajrayogini, who is the body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas. There the Lord pronounced these words, Greatly to be revered is this most secret of all secret things. This essence which is the body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas. O Vajragarbha, good, good indeed, thou great Bodhisattva of great compassion. Do thou listen to this which is named Hevajra, the essence of Vajrasattva, Mahasattva, and Mahasamayasattva. Vajragarbha replied, Why Vajrasattva? How so, Mahasattva? And wherefore, Samayasattva? May the Lord please explain. The Lord replied, It is indivisible and so known as Vajra, a being which is unity of three. Because of this device, he's known as Vajrasattva, adamantine being. He is full of the flavors of great knowledge, and so he is called Mahasattva, great being. From his continual creation of conventional forms as Samayasattva, convention being, he's named. Vajragarbha said, What is meant by this composite name of Hevajra? What is proclaimed by the sound He, and likewise what by Vajra? The Lord replied, By He is proclaimed great compassion and wisdom by Vajra. Do thou listen to this Tantra, the essence of wisdom and means which now is proclaimed by me. The Hevajra Tantra, a critical study by David Snellgrove. This is Darren Littlejohn. Welcome to episode 56 of the 12 Step Buddhist Podcast, focusing on today's topics the sound upgrade, the long term view, and continuing with practices of a bodhisattva, number 14, which is Should someone slander you throughout a billion worlds with a heart full of love to proclaim his good qualities? Are their good qualities in return is the practice of a bodhisattva. Well, we can all imagine slander, anyone who talks some smack, anything that happens on social media, which puts us into that position where we're going to get negative things are going to be said and what have you. That's just one individual, one moment, one experience. What it's talking about here and what Dharma texts often do is point us to the impossible, the insurmountable, the apparently unattainable, the over, overwhelmingly unattainable goal of, well, in this case, being able to not just withstand that and not just not react to that, but to turn it around and do an offering and do a practice of, it says a heart full of love. It doesn't say some bullshit. It doesn't say pretend, of course, pretending, but also using your imagination and also developing the aspiration is, 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 is a skill, is a method, but we weren't, it's just, it's not saying to just mouth the words, you know, to proclaim with a heart full of love, the good, they're good qualities. So they're going to go, you know, make a post that goes out to the cosmic universe to, uh, infinite number of social media outlets in every possible dimension and galaxy. And we're going to sit around and go, Hey man, it's cool. You know, this guy's awesome and he's got really good qualities. I mean, look at the tenacity there and the go forwardness. Obviously this kind of thing is ridiculous and impossible. And the Dharma does this to us over and over. 
and even if we don't get the instructions uh, written, the practice eventually, even if we try to leave the practice, the practice leads us to that opportunity. But this is the kind of practice that requires a long-term view. And if we try to get instant gratification as addicts do, we're going to be disappointed constantly and discouraged and really kind of doubt ourselves if we have the ability or the capacity or the, or the, or the worth, you know, of the, or, or the intrinsic value, you know, the inner internal value of, of oneself, you know, from oneself. You know, if we have that, then we have the confidence in our ability to attain. And what we want to attain is freedom, freedom from bondage, freedom from suffering. And the actual attainment of realization of Buddhahood is precisely that. And the doorway or the pathway or one of them is through the Mahayana, the great path, because it's a great, it's greater in scope. It reaches infinite beings instead of just working on, on oneself. Of course, we're working on ourselves to get to that point. So it's really, again, intrinsic, built in to the system. So if we just imagine this, there's an overwhelming uh, request here. Okay, if I'm going to be on the path and somebody slanders me, I've got to turn around and go, but they're wonderful. Um, well, take the steps, take the actions and see what happens. Test the results, right? But it's also impossible, right? And, and the Dharma knows this, the teaching knows this, the Buddha knows this. It's impossible. So we're trying to exhaust the intellectual aspect of mind and open up the heart aspect, so you know, if we look at these two, you know, going back to the Hivajra Tantra of the, of the I believe it's a, of the Maha Yoga system, and it talks about it, essentially the union of wisdom and compassion. Wisdom, you know, from the mental side, say, is the uh, attainment of the uh, realization of emptiness, which is fascinating because I'd recorded the podcast on the new um, new sound system here, the, the new PreSonus mic, and it's got its own cool software, and I'm on this whole Windows thing now, and, you know, I'm really trying to get this uh, deal sounding good for you. So, uh, well, give me a moment to fine-tune and learn this new system, but I didn't have time to watch 20 more videos, and I needed to get this podcast out to you. Um, but I had recorded this bit about wisdom and emptiness, and I think to my teacher, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, about this, and where I received many, a, 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 a caboodle of, you know, a lot, a condensed amount, an intense amount of teachings on this topic and practices and experiences. And last night I was laying, you know, laying in the bed and I, I was kind of late. I was working on this podcast stuff all day and it's hot. I don't know about you guys, but it's hot here and I'm kind of suffocating and sluggish and man, my brain is just mush half the time. So it's kind of hard to get clarity. Can't have the fan on while I'm doing the podcast. I'm kind of, ugh, you know, so I'm kind of sort of being present with that and working through it, but it was exhausting. My brain was really fried by the end of the night. And as I went to bed, I got a pop-up alert, Lama Zopa live now. And I'm like, Lama Zopa live now. And I hit that and I went to sleep listening to Lama Zopa, which is like, you know, when you're dropping into a, a different realm of like dream yoga consciousness, you know, I'm drifting off, but trying to maintain awareness of the hypnagogic or is it hypnopompic? Either way, the, go, the dropping in to sleep stage um, of consciousness, you know, I'm dropping into that with Lama Zopa and holding my heart to the guru yoga of connecting to the teacher and the teaching. And it's kind of, it's kind of coming to me from like some really deep kind of multidimensional multi-dimensional kind of levels. And really, I'm kind of really trying to absorb it because then I wanted to turn around and share it with you today. So we do know this. And, and something that Rinpoche said is that it requires, you know, I can't really quote precisely what he said. Um, I have to think a little bit more about it. But what it means is the precise knowledge of the experience of emptiness. And, you know, we have to have this. We have to attain this. This is attainable. And yet it is impossible. So it says, you know, the self has got to dissolve enough that anything that I'm attached to is going to go out to infinite beings. This is not just pretty poetry and prose-like lyrical words. Although 
they are presented to us in that nice. That's the form that these things were carried on at, from, say, 100 years after the Buddha died before the first word was written on anything, right? So these they're put into lyrical for more than one reason. Also, rhythmically, there is also pass keys to the way that the rhythms work and the words and the vibrations which bring us into an attunement of different uh, wisdom states, so to speak. So at any rate, we're talking about this, you know, wisdom as one half of the of the wing of of realization of attainment of total attainment and transcendence of suffering and compassion being the other and they're really not separated right they're they're not two different things as it's said in the tantra you know this is this is the teaching where in the tantra you'll note this is where the tantra begins part one paragraph one first thing is we begin with the precise knowledge of emptiness, we understand this going into Tantra. When we're in sutra stages of our development, we're not starting with emptiness, we're evolving to emptiness, we're evolving to that realization, which is where most of us are most of the time. And if any of us can jump into or drop into you know, the state of contemplation, we're in, you know, there is no duality, there is no reference point, or only spacious awareness and the reflection of all phenomena as mere uh, reflections instantly dissolving, you know, uh, upon, arri upon arrival, <laughs> upon arising, you know, like putting like when I barbecue and then at the end of the barbecue, I scrape it and then I toss some nice water on there and it goes Whoosh! and it all just disappears. All right. Now that's a good test of the mic. Did that, did that whoosh a clip? Um, we'll see on post here, but the idea, again, is to transcend suffering, to transcend limitation, to transcend attachment. This is the entire, this is the entire um, point. And, and we come to this point, um, integrated, you know, working with compassion. And working with compassion means instead of taking a position of I am, a, I am an inherently existent being that exists from my own side. I got here by myself and I'm in charge. Uh kind of look at that fallacy and it it falls apart. You know, again, Lama Zopa Rinpoche in the Majjhimika school and, and so forth is like dropping apart the logical, uh, the intellectual, right? But we can really get into an experiential with this as well. You know, there are many paths to the wisdom and to the understanding. One thing is that we can get to the understanding of emptiness by trying to let go of everything, by offering everything to, to everyone. Well, letting it all go in the chid practice, letting it all completely the body, letting all attachment to everything go, you know, completely transcend it. That gets us to the wisdom of emptiness, or we can have an experience of the wisdom of emptiness and we can infinitely um, expand our compassion, right? So we did get the new tunes, you know, the new, new, uh, the new jams here going on. This is also sound, sound production studio kind of set up here, uh, Sonic uh, Studio One, rather, pre-Sonus and Studio One. So looks like a lot of pros use it, and it was a great deal and great uh, software, well, much better than what I was using before. So like I said, give me a moment to get it, get it super dialed. But I want to go into this idea of the long-term view because the attainment, first we got to know that attainment is possible. And I want to tell you that if you don't know that attainment is possible, I'm telling you, attainment is possible. If that doesn't work for you, find a master of which I'm not a master or posing or alluding to be far from it. Um, but you can find a master who point this out to you. And when I say point this out to you, that's directly exactly what it means to introduce you to your real nature, your state of primordial awareness without boundary, without beginning or end, without reference. To say it's egoless is ridiculous. It's like it was egoless before you even started. You know, it's so beyond any conception that we can't even speak of it really. You know, we can only point to it, right? And I'm not a master pointing to it. I'm just talking about it. This is my experience. This is letting go of attachment. This is working with recovery. This is using Dharma principles. And, you know, Compassionate Recovery, my most recent book available on Amazon and through Barnes and Noble online and everywhere, you can go into Powell's books or wherever and ask them to put it on the shelf. 
next to the 12 step Buddhist. That helps a lot. Reviews on Amazon help a lot. But this whole point of taking the Dharma from 12 step Buddhist into taking recovery into compassionate recovery and a set of principles that don't even have Buddhism attached to them. But if you understand the Dharma from this perspective, as we're discussing here, this will be very meaningful and valid and very substantial for you going into the practice of healing through compassionate recovery. If you have what it takes to do the healing, if you want to just take your chances, go ahead. But I've seen it. I've seen enough death. I have enough people on my death roster that I do practice for in the Sutra practice for that. We did a little bit of, I think a couple of podcasts ago in the beginning I've seen enough death. I've been close enough to death. I've seen enough people go death jails and institutions. You know, I mean, I'm willing to, you know, let's rethink the addiction and let's rethink recovery from the ground up, please. Compassion, recovery, read it. It's important. And you can get books for other people in prison or in treatment. If you go to compassionatecovery.us, go to books for addicts, you can donate books. We can also personalize them, et cetera, and so forth. Audiobook is also up. All right. So I'm just saying, get it, read it, please. If you can't afford it, email me. I'll give it to you for free. Okay. I'll give you a, an ebook. All right. For free. It's not a problem. Now, it will always be free and it will always be open to feedback. This isn't just coming from my own ego. It's not about me. It's about us. So if someone should slander you and we have this attachment and this gut level reaction, we've got to go so far beyond even just that. And what we've got to do is achieve the impossible and we have to have, have the ability and faith in ourselves. And if we don't have the faith in ourselves, we have the faith in the teaching. And if you want to just read words of the Buddha, which are, you know, the beginning of the teachings, and you can do that, but it's much more alive if you find a teacher at any level, a good, solid practitioner, someone who lives it. You know, I wrote a book called uh, something about how to find a spiritual teacher. It's ebook only, but it's up there on Amazon. You know, so we're, we're going to look for a second here at the long at the long term view, and you know, from the New York Times today by William McCaskill, and today is what it's the sixth of August, by William McCaskill, and just a couple paragraphs here. It really is an interesting perspective, especially if you put it in the context of the Dharma, which, if we're practitioners, we're always bringing the worldly things into the view of Dharma and its direct application to our lives. This is practicing the principles in all of our affairs, internal, external, in our mind, in our heart, and our soul. Okay? So just, anyways, here we go. Imagine living the life of every human being who has ever existed in order of birth. Did I give you the title of this article? Here, let me see. Bling, bling. Okay. Opinion, guest, essay, the New York Times, The Case for Long-Termism, August 5th, 2022, by William McCaskill. Continuing. Imagine living the life of every human being who has ever existed in order of birth. Your first life begins about 300,000 years ago in Africa. After living that life and dying, you travel back in time to be reincarnated as the second ever person, born slightly later than the first, then the third ever person, and so on. 100 billion or so lives later, you are the youngest person alive today. Your life has lasted somewhere in the ballpark of 4 trillion years, a full 20% raising children, and over 1% suffering from malaria or smallpox. You spent 1.5 billion years having sex. Let that sink in. That's your life so far, from the birth of Homo sapiens until the present. Now, imagine that you live all future lives, too. Your life, we hope, would be just beginning. Even if humanity lasts only as long as the typical mammal species, approximately one million years, and even if the world population falls to a tenth of its current size, 99.5% of your life would still be ahead of you on the scale of a typical human being, you in the present would be just a few months old. The future is big. Just an interesting article to consider the scope of the long-term view. If you listen to these types of words, and that's a very, very interesting way. I thought it was a very intriguing description. If you let these sink in, in, the, in again, everything comes into the Dharma. Lens, all right, we bring it in 
to try to understand how this relates to our lives on, on our committed path if we're a Buddhist. If we're a looky-loo, then that's a different deal. There's something to be said for finding something to commit to and, you know, develop over time. Well, with that overview, just say generally how it is for me, a little check-in. The idea is for me that with the complex PTSD and a lot of ups and downs and getting in and out of the window of tolerance, getting thrown in and out of it by triggers and all that sort of thing. And, and if none of this makes sense, just read Compassionate Recovery and you'll see it's all clear. But, you know, in the context of my experience in daily life, you know, I've got to do a lot of regulation, you know, a lot of work to, as my old AA sponsor Vest used to say, aspire to the level of normal person. And like it says in the AA, in the 12-step literature, you know, our spiritual journey and this development um, will take a lot of time. It says it'll take time, maybe a long time, or maybe a lot of time, something like this. You know, so we're looking at the long-term view. That gives us a little space, and that doesn't mean that we let up. We're walking up the mountain. That doesn't mean we stop. But it means that we understand that we are in the present moment, one step at a time, feel our feet on the earth and try to be in compassion for others. Okay, we're at 23 minutes. That's going to be a wrap. I hope you dig the new sound and that you pass on the ideas of the podcast and of the work that I've written about and that others have written about. I do have some guests coming up now that I have the nice new setup for bringing people in. So I'm going to get some interviews going and we'll take it from there. Thanks so much for listening. As always, peace out and namaste.